Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's TSVP talk. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Yana Puyo. Yana is a professor of mathematics in Linköping University in Sweden, and uh, she also received her post, uh, PhD in the same university in 1996. And after that, she was a postdoc at the University of Michigan and Amber, and then at the Lund University. Uh, she has been visiting many institutions, in, including Charles University in Prague, University of Cincinnati, and um, Mittag Leffler Institute. And uh, uh, Jana is uh, um, working on analysis on metrics basis, um, including um, PDEs, especially uh, P Laplace equations. So um, today uh, we are very happy. Um, Jana is going to give a, a general audience lecture related to her work. The title is Metric Spaces. Navigating in a world without directions. Thank you, Ching. Can you hear me? And it works. Yeah. Thank you, Ching, for the introduction. And I would also like to thank TSVP for letting me spend a time a semester here in Okinawa. So it's really exciting to be here. Uh, I have prepared this talk for a really general audience. So I'm a little worried that it will be too simple and maybe boring for all of you, but well, let's see. I at least have a lot of pictures. I will not really give any theorems. Uh, so maybe I will just try to give you some ideas where you can see all kinds of different metric spaces and maybe they can be useful for some things. Uh, I would also like to apologize to the physicists for my very naive understanding of physics. I will have some examples from, well, pretending to be from physics in the real world, and they are probably very naive uh, for the experts. So I will start with uh, a map of uh, the OIST, Institute of Science and Technology. And when you came here to this room, uh, many of you were coming from the TSVP to lab four, and you can take different ways as you move here. One is if you want to avoid elevators, that's the one I took. Uh, well, then you maybe want to stay on level E and you take the hillside of the buildings. If you are interested in the shortest way and don't mind elevators, then you go down to level C and take the other side of the building. If it's raining, maybe you go all the way down to, to skip the rain. If you were a bird or there were skywalks, you could walk directly on the sky, skywalks or you could fly. And all of these give you different routes. So they give you different distances as you move from lab five to lab four. If you add some more conditions that you want to uh, fulfill on your walk, for example, you want to get the coffee in Cafe Tancha. Uh, then you walk here first, and then you go to, to lab four. And what happens then is that this route through Cafe Tancha, so TSVP to Cafe Tancha, and then Tancha to lab four, will necessarily be longer, or at least not shorter, than the direct route. And this is a triangle inequality that all kinds of distances satisfy. So with that type of distance that whenever you go somewhere and your high priority is coffee, you want to go via Cafe Tancha, the OIST would look like this, like this graph, Tancha in the middle, and then you would have connection to all the labs like that. Uh, these types of distances and graphs, they appear sort of everywhere. So I took another example here from, uh, from uh, airlines, and I guess, I guess to this island, all of us have to come by plane, and depending on the airline, there may be different routes. So again, here we have an example uh, from Okinawa to Taipei. There's a direct route with China Air, but if you want to go with the Japanese airlines, you would have to go uh, probably to Tokyo or at least Osaka. Uh, on the other hand, with the Japanese airlines, Fukuoka and Nagoya have uh, several different flights a day, uh, but with uh, team, China Air, other airlines, you would, might have to go um, to Taipei or maybe to Seoul and to get to Nagoya. So this is just to give you some ideas of the, in our everyday life, we see all kinds of differences 
and we don't even think about that. And while we are starting to think about these types of rules, then it does not really matter in which direction we are moving, because um, like here with the air flight, first you go to the south and then you go north back, even though you just wanted to go east. So once on the island here in Okinawa, again, we can think of different types of different distances and metrics, how we measure the way we move around. If the whole island was a homogeneous jungle, then we would just use the standard Euclidean metric, where we take the difference in the x coordinates between two points, A and B. So the difference in the x coordinates squared plus the difference in the y coordinates square, and then square root of that. That's the Pythagoras theorem, and that gives us the standard shortest distance between two points. Once you move to an inhibited area with, say, orthogonal street system, then you have to go along those streets, and the distances and the metric changes again. Uh, you will be using the L1 metric, where you just add the difference in the x coordinates and the differences in the y coordinates. And you see also in this picture, that what happens here is that there are no longer unique shortest curves. From this point to that point, I can go this way or I can go that way. And both routes will have the same length. And this is just another example. If you forget about everything and just move by car in, in Okinawa, then you get some kind of a road system like this that looks a bit like a graph. And again, if I want to go from here to here, I may have to go first to the north along the E58 and then back along the other E58. So again, we are losing the sense of distances. So it does not really matter in which direction we are moving. What matters is the length and of our path and the distance between uh, various points. So this brings us to the definition of a metric space. And I'm sure that everybody knows, or most of you know what the metric is, but I just want to recall it. So a metric space is any set whatsoever. And on that set, we have a so-called metric, which is a function of two variables, x and y are points in this set. And a metric then is the, is the distance between these two points. So it is a non-negative number and it satisfies some properties. So if the points are not the same, then the distance is always positive. If the, distance, if the two points are just one point, the distance from one point to itself is zero. And then we have this triangle inequality that if we go directly from X to Y, then it's always uh, shorter or the same as going from X to Z and then from Z to Y. So this is the, the route that we would take through Cafe Tancha, and this would be the direct route from lab five to lab four. And I tried to draw here some examples to, to give you an idea that it can really be uh, any set that you take. It could be some nice open set, some domain in, in a Euclidean space, in the plane or in the space. It could be some graph like this that we saw uh, on the road system. It can be fractal sets. I will come to this one later, so don't worry too much about what it looks like, but some kind of fractal set. And so we have this set with a way of measuring distances called a metric. And then one can define new metrics. On, uh, on such a set. So the metric is not unique for a given set. A given set can have very different types of measuring distances, like we saw with the standard homogeneous jungle distance on Okinawa or the orthogonal street system uh, metric in the inhabited areas. And so if we have some metric space with a metric, we can look at all curves that go between two points, and we can define a new metric in this way. So imagine that we take some other island, which is very hilly, 
and then maybe there is a non-homogeneous jungle there as well. So some places are more difficult to walk in, whereas some others are easier. And so you take a weight function, which somehow describes how difficult it is to walk, to move through, through that area. So it could be the slope of the hill that you are climbing or how dense the jungle is at that very point. And then given two points in that set, so let's say we're going to go from one point to some other point here. Uh, you look at all curves between these two points, like here, and you integrate this cost that it gives you, over how much effort you have to put into moving from that point to the other one along this curve. And then you try to find this infimum, the, the shortest um, or the, the easiest curve that you can take, where it takes the least effort or the least time to get from X to Y. That's a new metric. It again still satisfies, at least under certain assumptions, these properties. And so that's a way of changing a metric on a metric space into some other metric and getting a new metric space. This is just another example of the same situation. Uh, so imagine here this island is flat, but instead everybody likes beaches. So there is a lot of people along the beaches and there is a traffic jam near the coast. So if you want to go between these two points here and there, you will not travel along the coast because you will have to uh, wait in the traffic jam and fight with all the people who are there. Uh, but instead you would like to go a bit inside and then back. So here the weight function, and the cost of your travel will be one over distance to the coast, or possibly you could take a power of that as well. Uh, this type of metric is called the hyperbolic metric and it's used uh, in hyperbolic geometry. We heard a talk on this about two weeks ago. And one example there is the hyperbolic disk, which is just a disk, but instead of the standard metric, standard distances like we have in the plane, uh, the weight function is, this is roughly the distance to the boundary and the shorter distances, the shortest curves, the geodesics then look like this. These are circles that are perpendicular to, to this, this uh, uh, to the boundary of that hyperbolic disk. And this means sort of this uh, weight function means that it takes time. It's, it's hard to walk, it's hard to move near the boundary of the disk or the island here. So you move slow and that's why it costs that. And that's why you don't want to travel for too much. Now you are close to the boundary, you go inside like this. So these were some examples of uh, how you can make new metrics. And I have two more examples that are based on another area, um, idea, how to make new metrics on your metric spaces. And these are based on vector fields. Uh, they are used in, or the, this falls into the area of sub riemannian geometry. Uh, which I'm not going to talk about. So these are for me just two examples. Uh, but the idea is that um, if you want to go from a point to another point and you want to measure the distance between these two points, then you are only allowed to follow curves that um, have a tangent. So, so you, your velocity at a given point is prescribed by given vector field. So at every point in the set, there are, well, in these examples, there are two vectors given, one and another vector somehow. And if you want to move, you can only move, um, your, your velocity can only be a linear combination like here. So this is my velocity as I go along this curve and it has to be a linear combination uh, of these two vectors that are prescribed at every point. So one example is the so-called Grushin plane. So there you have two directions. One is called X. So at every point you can go in the X direction. There's the blue arrows here. 
And then there is a y direction, which is uh, moving in the y direction like this, the red arrows, but the velocity or the speed you can move in the y direction with a certain effort is proportional to the x coordinate. So if you are close to the y axis, you can only move slowly in this direction because x is small. If you are further away from the y axis, you can move faster with the same effort. And on the y axis, x is equal to zero. So if I am here on the y axis, I'm not allowed to move at all in the y direction. So if I want to move somewhere from the y axis, I first have to go in the blue direction in one or I can, these numbers A and B can be negative. So I'm also allowed to go in this direction as well. So I have to move away from the y axis first and then I can move along the red arrows and then I can possibly come back to y axis. So that would be a way of going from the origin to another point on a y axis. And being on Okinawa, I thought I, I saw some analogy between this and the rip currents. So if you have a rip current here, you do not want to swim against it and you do not want to swim with the current. So that's the y axis here. What you do is you first move away from the current and then you can move in the direction that you want using the red arrow like here. And another example that um, is also uh, very useful and very common is the Heisenberg group, which is roughly, which is basically the three dimensional space R3, but you are only allowed to move in two directions. One is this vector field X, so again, uh, this is moving in the x direction. So x, notice here, x axis is pointing into the, uh, the board. That's how I draw it to get reasonably nice picture. So you can move in x direction and plus a little bit in the t direction, which is going up, but that you can only do, um, well, how much you can do that depends on the y coordinate. Um, so if you are in the origin, there are not these parts at all because x and y are zero. So you can only move horizontally. You can move in the blue direction here in x direction and in the y direction from the other vector field y, that's the red arrow here. But if you move a little bit on the y axis, then here x is still zero. So the red arrow will just be moving in the y direction, but the x blue arrow suddenly gets a little bit contribution of the t direction going up. So this blue arrow points a little bit up. So when we are at this point and we want to follow a curve somehow to get from a point to somewhere else, this point, we can go a little bit up. So we can move in this green plane. In the origin, we can only move in a horizontal plane like that. And here it's the similar, but X and Y are interchanged. Anywhere else on the T axis, again, X, X and Y are zero. So there we only have the horizontal direction. So we are in a three dimensional space, but we can always only move in two directions. We have two dimensional freedom. And this again, uh, is this one can define a metric. Uh, and uh, this makes an interesting metric space to study. I will not really use it for anything, but I wanted to give you the example. So now I want to start talking a little bit about um, harmonic or I will actually only speak about harmonic functions to make life easy, but everything I will say would work for p-harmonic functions for those who, who know uh, what that is. So let me just very naively give you an idea why harmonic functions uh, are interesting. They appear quite a lot everywhere in a lot of problems. So imagine here we have a wall uh, which is insulating 
um, our house, the room from the outside world. Now, this picture is not really adapted to Okinawa, um, maybe more from Europe, somewhere where you would have zero degrees outside and you would have 20 degrees in your room. And then uh, the temperature in the wall will be linearly increasing from zero to 20 degrees. And you see exactly the same picture if you take a capacitor, um, I think it's called a capacitor and not condenser nowadays. So, uh, so you have two plates, you have put the charge, positive, negative charge on them. Then you have electric field be between them, which is a gradient of some potential U. And again, if the picture looks like this, two parallel plates, uh, then the potential will be linear function like this. And that's exactly the same picture. I have a third picture. That if you just take a metal rod, just a stick like this, and again, as in the wall, we keep temperature zero at one end, temperature 20 degrees at the other end, then if the rod is homogeneous, the temperature will increase linearly inside the rod from zero to 20 degrees. These are just two other two-dimensional examples of the same phenomenon. So this time, this is not a wall, but this is maybe a water pipe, um, like a cut through a water pipe. And this is some insulation about it. So in the water pipe, you have 50 degrees water. Outside, it's zero. And then if you look at how the temperature is distributed, in this analysis, in the insulation of the water pipe, it looks like this. It's zero here at the annulus. So these are, you think of the annulus being here. So this would, here would be the ball that, and then here it is 50 degrees and in between it looks a bit like that. And the same phenomenon would be for the potential if one has a spherical capacitor. So this charges, positive negative charges on two concentric spheres and the electric field would be in between them like this. Um, and here is just, well, a little derivation that the, all these functions here, the linear ones and these here are harmonic functions in the set. So here in the analysis and here in between the plates or inside in the wall. Is they satisfy the Laplace equation, Laplace operator, which is just the sum of second derivatives. This is written now in three dimensions, whereas here I only have two. Uh, but you, well, I guess everybody has seen this before. And so harmonic functions satisfy the Laplace equation, Laplace operator equal to zero. And there's a similar P Laplace operator, P Laplace equation, where, which I'm not writing down here, and I will not really talk so much about it, but basically what I say would apply to it as well in metric space. So these are harmonic functions and they are useful. Um, so here I have a little bit more on that. Why would we go into metric spaces? So imagine now that we have three rods or we have a network of rods where we are looking at the temperature distribution. So for simplicity, three rods like this, the end temperatures are zero, 10 and 20 degrees. They are all the same length. Maybe I didn't manage to draw them so, but that's what we pretend to. And then the temperature on each rod, it will be linear. And here in this middle point, it will be the average of these three temperatures. So if I now call the temperature T function U instead, uh, what this means that here it's the average. So it's a mean value property for that function. And one way of writing it is that uh, if I take my point X here in the middle, and then I look at all of its neighbors, X prime, so that would be these three neighbors or these four neighbors here in the red picture, uh, then the sum of these differences should be zero. If you take the sum of these neighbors to the right-hand side, you easily see that it exactly uh, gives you the mean value property. Value here is the average of the other 
three neighbors. Uh, this was in homogeneous uh, rods. If you take uh, rods of different materials and say that the thermal conductivity in one of them, in this one, would be four times as big as the others, then that kind of means that this rod is counted four times. And then one gets a weighted average here. And the equation that we had here describing the mean value property would be a weighted equation where the thermal conductivity appears. So this could be a definition, or this is a definition of harmonic function on a graph like this. Uh, if you have different lengths and different conductivities, then that has to be taken into account, but one kind of can write a similar, uh, similar description and characterization. An interesting thing that will be useful on the soon on the coming slide is that harmonic functions minimize the energy. So this is sort of the square root of the gradient, something. And this is how much it weighs on each edge. And one um, problem that one often studies for harmonic functions or other differential equations is you want to solve a Dirichlet problem. So what you have is you have an open set G, which in this case of a graph would be all these red edges that are here, the blue dots, or purple dots, um, then emo dots would be uh, would be the boundary of this set, and so you may have some boundary data prescribed on that set, u equal to f on the boundary of the purple boundary, and you want to find a function that is harmonic in this red set, so it satisfies this equation on every interior point. So on these four interior points, it would satisfy that mean value property. So these are just graphs. Imagine now that you have a general metric phase and you want to look at harmonic functions or more generally p-harmonic functions. Uh, the metric is very general. It could look like this. So imagine you are looking at temperature distribution in, in some mass like that. And so how could one define and talk about harmonic function? We don't have any directions. We don't have any partial derivative. So we cannot really define the Laplace operator in the usual way. And this was already something that was visible on the graph because the directions of the edges in the graph were not, did not really play any role for the definition of harmonic functions. So the main idea how to define harmonic or be harmonic functions on um, general metric space is the following solutions of the Laplace equation. So harmonic functions in our standard uh, world, they minimize the energy given by the integral of the square of the length of the gradient, the modulus of the gradient square. So this is the energy of the function. And harmonic functions, they try to make this as small as they can among functions um, that say have the same boundary values. So how to make sense of this in a metric space? Well, the first step is to replace this integration by something that's reasonable on a metric space. And so on the metric space X, we put a measure, mu. And now, well, if you are not familiar with measures, then a measure is just a way of measuring size of various sets. And it does it in an additive way for the joint sets. So if A and A prime are two disjoint sets, then the total measure, the mass or volume or weight of them will be the sum of the individual measures for the, these two sets, A and the set. A prime. So that's a measure, a way of measuring size, mass. That's, and then we need to replace this gradient or the modulus of the gradient by something uh, to make sense out of this integral. And uh, that can be done by so called minimal weak upper gradients. Uh, and that is defined in the following. And now this is long text, but I will try to explain it. So we have a function u and its 
minimal weak upper gradient, GU, will be the smallest non-negative function that controls the function values along curves. So if we have two points for any two points X and Y in our space, and for almost all curves, gamma, that connect these two points, and almost all means, well, it's in some sense that can be made precise, but I will not do that. Uh, so for almost all curves, the values of the function at this point and at that point, they differ at most by the curve integral of this gradient, GU. So we, we take, it's like the weight we were integrating when getting through the non-homogeneous jungle. So this controls these differences for any two points and almost all curves of finite length. And then one takes the smallest possible such function g. It can be shown that, and again, under certain assumptions, such a function exists. That will be our substitute for the modulus of the gradient. So just to show you here that uh, this is not coming out of blue, this basically generalizes the fundamental theorem of calculus on, on a real line, the difference of function values in two points will be exactly equal to the gradient, uh, to the integral of the derivative. And here we've sort of put absolute values on that and inequality. And in Rn, in uh, say three or and dimensional Euclidean space, this minimal gradient is actually equal to the modulus, or at least for nice functions, say Lipschitz functions. And on the graphs, we basically get what we want as well. And this can be defined on any metric space, like this one. Sometimes it's useful and sometimes it's less useful notion. And, but it gives us a possibility to define harmonic functions. Uh, in the following way. So here we have an open set in any metric space X. So it will not maybe look this nice, maybe very rough or fractal or something, but it's an open set in that space. And we have a function U, the blue one here. And that function U is called harmonic if it locally minimizes the energy given by the minimal upper gradient. So whenever I take some function phi that I add to this function, which has support inside of this set G, so it dies to zero before it reaches the boundary of G. Uh, and then I look at the energy of this modified function. Um, it will not be smaller than our function U. This means that the function U is harmonic. This is the definition. And the one can think about what kinds of test functions do I want to he use here in um, Rn. The one usually would work with C infinity functions or C zero infinity functions, compact support, and so on. Um, that we cannot do in a metric space because we don't have so smooth functions. We don't have derivatives. But we can anyway talk about Lipschitz functions. If you don't know what the Lipschitz function is, it's sort of some class of nice functions. And those are still possible on a metric space. And they give us a large class of test functions to define this notion of harmonicity in a reasonable way. So there is, I want to give you now some examples. First, some bad examples. If the space is such that there are no curves in it, so it would just be a lot of dots everywhere, or if there are very few curves in that space, then we come back here. Looking at the definition of the minimal upper gradient, that was defined through curves. If I don't have any curves, then this condition is just empty. So I may as well take the minimal upper gradient to be zero because I don't have to satisfy anything. There are no curves to test it with. So in such situation, any function has zero as an upper gradient. And so this will be zero, this will be zero. All functions are harmonic. And that's not very interesting to study. 
Another, maybe a little bit more illuminating example is, let's take a bow, so-called bow tie. So you take the first and the third quadrant in the plane. This one and that one, X plus and X minus. They are only connected through the origin. So there are curves between those two parts. And in each of these two halves, you have plenty of curves. That basically behaves like, like a plane. But the number of curves going through the origin is small. It's not enough for these two halves to communicate in an efficient way with each other. And that in particular means that if you take this characteristic function, you put one on x plus on one half of the bow tie and zero on the other half, uh, even though this function is not continuous, it will actually have the gradient zero, even at this point. And so again, the energy for that function will be zero and it will be harmonic. And that's not really desirable because such a function is not continuous and we would like to have um, harmonic functions to, to be continuous. So these are bad examples. I have some good examples as well. Um, and there are two general assumptions that guarantee that the theory of harmonic functions becomes nice. And one is that the measure we have put on the metric space is so-called doubling measure. So if you measure the size of a ball with radius 4, you can always control it by some constant times the measure of the ball with the concentric ball with radius r. That's the doubling condition. And there is another requirement, so-called Poincaré inequality, which I'm not writing down, but it roughly controls mean oscillation on functions uh, on balls by the gradients. So the gradients are not, not zero all the time, or they are not too small. They are strong enough to control the function. Uh, this can be written down, but that's, there's no point in doing it here. So some good examples of sets or spaces, metric spaces that satisfy these two assumptions, uh, there are plenty of such spaces. And one of them is sufficiently nice set in um, Euclidean space, so in the plane or in Rn. And, and that class is so-called uniform domains. So here I draw a uniform domain, an attempt. And these are points uh, where any two points can be connected by a banana curve. So what's a banana curve? It looks like a banana. And the middle of it, so the curve is here. That's the black thing going between the two points. And the property it has is that um, as you travel along the curve, you can put in a ball inside the domain placed that curve and the size of the ball is proportional to the distance from along the curve from this center from this point to the end point so if i start here i need a ball of size zero but as i move along the curve the balls have to grow a little and so this along going along this curve this makes a banana and that has to fit into the set for any pair of points. These are uniform domains. For example, all domains with Lipschitz boundary or, or balls in, a, in Rn have this property. And so they are nice and the whole theory of harmonic functions on metric spaces uh, works for them. Another example that looks a little bit more rough is the funk of snowflake, which you get by adding triangles like this scaled by one third. And so you get some fractal thing that is very, very rough uh, here, but again, since we are always have the freedom of going in some of these triangles, um, you 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 get this banana. And this is another example, so called Sharpinsky carpet. I mean, these are not my examples, so I'm I'm not really giving you any of my theorems. I just want to give you the idea of the of the theory. And um, so this is a Sharpinsky carpet. You take a square, cut it in, say, well, you take an odd number, a sequence of odd numbers. So you take the first odd number that we have chosen, we chose three, and then we cut it in three 
part in each direction, and then we remove the middle square. And then we take an X, some other odd number that we have chosen, for example, five, and then we each of the remaining squares, we cut into five times five squares, and again, remove the middle one, and so on. And if these numbers, the sequence is chosen so that the sum of one over an converges, then this will produce in the end, when you have removed all the squares, this will uh, produce a fractal set, which actually has this doubling property and the Poincaré inequality. So it is nice for the whole theory of, of harmonic functions on metric spaces. The Heisenberg group and Groschen plane are other examples. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, here are some more good examples. You can take, maybe I just give you the examples and <laughs> not get to the last slide, but it doesn't matter. Um, you take, you can take finite graphs like this, and also some infinite graphs uh, work. For example, here we have an infinite tree, and as long as it has bounded degree, uh, like this, it can go forever, but it never split into more than 3,000 new, um, new edges, then uh, this will satisfy the assumptions. One can also play with these a little bit. Um, well, it will, this will actually satisfy it only locally for, on balls up to certain size. Uh, but if we then change it a little bit and we shrink the edges, as we go along and we shrink them uh, geometrically, for example, exponentially, um, sort of so that in the end generation at the end level, they had length of some number between zero and one to power n, so they are shrinking, then we get a, a graph that satisfies the doubling condition and the Poincaré inequality um, globally. And this is, uh, these are some other examples about gluing spaces. So we had already this example of a bow tie where when we glued just in the origin, that was not okay because there were too few curves going between those two halves. So let's make this now infinite, infinite chessboard. We take a lot of squares that we glue like this at the corners and we just take the black squares for, uh, for our metric space. Again, the gluing here at these points is too weak. There will be too few curves, and so the Poincaré inequality will not hold, but we can change the measure a little bit. So we put more weight to the points that are close to these connecting points. It can be written. So it will be basically inverse proportional to the distance to these uh, nodes. And by doing that, by changing the matter, ma measure and giving more weight to those points, then one gets a space that satisfies the Poincaré inequality, at least locally. But that's usually enough for a lot of the theory. And there are some other examples of gluing. If you glue two planes and here you take some sort of a counter set, you identify these two points. So here you have like secret skywalks in between. Then that again gives examples of nice metric spaces where a lot of the harmonic and p-harmonic function theory go through. A uh, product of two nice spaces also satisfy those assumptions. So what kind of, pro how many minutes, how much time do I have or should I already finish? Maybe I can, 10 minutes? Oh, first one. So what kind of problems would, can we look at? And uh, well, one of the basic problems is to study the Dirichlet problem. I already mentioned in the connection with the graph. So you have an open set G. So here it will be this well, donut with a handle or something. Um, so there can be holes in it. It can be pretty wild open set as long as it's open. And then you have boundary data F given on the boundary, so on this boundary and also on this boundary. And you are looking for a harmonic function that has these boundary values. In some sense, it usually cannot have them as a limit, at least not at all points, if the set is not very nice. But in some sense, there's a way of attaching a harmonic function to these boundary values. That actually will be the last statement that I will 
give you as a theorem. Uh, so that's one problem you want to study. Sometimes you might want to add Neumann data on a part of the boundary. So let's take this part of the boundary and instead of requiring the function to be equal to f, you want the normal derivative to be zero. So in a world uh, or in a real world situation, this might mean that here we know the temperature of this body on the blue part. And on the red part, we know there is no, no flux. There is insulation. There is perfect insulation, so the temperature is not changing here. It has X, zero derivative in the normal direction. And so these are two problems. This is the Dirichlet problem. This is often called uh, um, the mixed or sometimes Zaremba boundary value problem. The funny thing with metric spaces is that we can actually see in both of these problems as one problem. You can see them as a Dirichlet problem, both of them, because by a suitable choice of metric spaces, we can get rid of the Neumann data, which often are more difficult to handle than the Dirichlet data. So this is an example of, a, okay, let's take a unit ball in Rn, which is a nice set. And if I want to take uh, just the Dirichlet data, well, then I add the boundary to it, consider that as my metric space X, so the closed ball will be the space, and G is the open set is the open ball. And this is the boundary in this matrix, or this is the boundary in the whole space Rn as well. Uh, now, if we change the outside world, we change the metric space X, and we take it to be the open ball together with this half sphere. So we add this to the open ball, and together the open ball with this half sphere, half of the boundary, is a metric space. So that's our space, that's our universe, nothing outside exists. That's all we know. And it happens to be also quite a nice space, so one can um, yeah, do the theory on such a space. And in this situation, uh, this, this is not really a boundary because this, these points are not at all in the space, in our universe. So these sort of behave like interior points and that automatically forces the harmonic functions to have the zero normal derivative there. So in a way, this is now just a Dirichlet problem on this set G seen in this metric space with this boundary and this boundary data. So the Neumann condition disappears magically. Um, so in those previous examples, you could say, okay, you can only do this for very nice uh, sets like balls. Well, in fact, the Neumann data should be given or they should at least be contained in a nice set so that one can add it uh, and, and do sort of get a nice space X. So again, let's still work on the unit ball like this. I take as, uh, as the metric space X, the closed ball. And then here I have this blue set here is a closed set, but it can be bad, it can be rough, it can be fractal or whatever. And I prescribe the boundary data on this, uh, yeah, and G will be the rest. And, and actually now these points will be the interior points in this set G. Um, so if we prescribe the Dirichlet data, U equal to some boundary, data S on this blue contour here. That's the boundary of G within the closed unit ball. And then here, these points in this world, they are not boundary points. They are interior points for our set G. And the 
harmonic, any harmonic function then here will automatically have to be, um, it'll have zero, yeah, it'll be constant along sort of the normal derivatives. It will have zero normal derivatives. So it will automatically satisfy this equation if you see it as a function from just the standard Rn. And the reason is that these are interior points in this funny world um, X. And if we then would take and replace this ball by the von Koch snowflake, which on the previous slide we saw was a nice set, so it can serve as a nice metric space, then one could make this Neumann data exist on a sort of rough, rough boundary of the snowflake as well. It doesn't cover all situations, but it covers actually quite a lot of rough situations as well. And one more um, situation where changing a metric and using metric spaces can help us to treat more general boundary data is take a disk and cut it here. Or you could take a ball and cut it, um, take an orange and cut into it with a knife. So here you get two sides of the cut from above and from below. And for some reason, many one would like to have boundary data that are zero on the upper part of the cut and one on the lower part of the cut. Now, if this is just seen as a set with this boundary in the plane, then the boundary data should be given on this cut, on this cut as one function not as two different values from above and from below. By, but using a new metric in this cut split disk, we can actually include these boundary data into the theory that we are dealing with. And we can then solve a Dirichlet problem for this type of the boundary, of such boundary data. And the way to do it is to change the metric a little bit inside in this cut split disk. So what we do is that instead of looking at the standard distance between two points, X and Y, we take the shortest distance between these two points, which is achieved um, or can be achieved when we uh, move just inside the set G. So we are not allowed to cross this line. So this will be the short shortest distance between x and y. Uh, so this kind of opens the split a little bit, makes it into Pac-Man picture like that. And this gives us the new metric space with the new metric. And this change of the metric is so nice that inside in the set, in the domain G, it does not change the notion of harmonic functions. It's still preserve the harmonic function in the original metric, they will still be harmonic in this new one and the other way down. And so with this one can solve the Dirichlet problem for more general boundary data like this. Other thing that I'm not going to talk about, but one can play a little bit more is there are other changes of metric. You can take unbounded sets and wrap them and make bounded ones. Those are often easier to deal with, or if for some reason you want to unwrap the bounded set and make them unbounded, then that's possible as well. And I guess I should stop. And this is my slide, last slide, and here is just a, one of our theorems. It's not the most deep one, but it was easy to formulate. It basically gives a unique existence of solutions to, to the Dirichlet problem, where the boundary data for continuous functions are attained at most boundary points in some sense of capacity. And it just illustrates that um, if you would not have the Poincare inequality, then at least in this situation, the uniqueness will be lost. Say in the chessboard, with the standard measure where the Poincare inequality does not hold, if you want to solve the Riclet problem on this set with these blue boundary values, then the solution will be determined here on the blue pieces, but these two squares are so loosely connected to, to the rest of the space. So the boundary data don't have an influence on what happens here. 
so one can basically um, choose any two constants for the two red squares. And that was it. I hope I did not take too much time. And thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Jana, for this great talk. Uh, are there any questions or comments? So in physics, we're usually solving the Dirichlet problem on Rn, yeah. uh, looking at a differential equation with boundary conditions. And then, um, well, the most common thing to do would be to to use Green's functions and uh, yeah. and get an integral solution. It, it's, are, uh, are there always integral solutions on these more general metric spaces, or is it more difficult? OK, there are two things to it. So first, I was only talking about harmonic functions, which is a linear equation. Uh, most of the theory we do is actually for so-called p-harmonic functions, and those are based on a nonlinear operator, the p-Laplacian. And there's uh, no way of uh, using integral um, representations for the solution if you have a nonlinear equation. So that's something that we have not really been looking at. You can still talk about fundamental solutions that would be solving the equation with, say, a Dirac at one point, but you cannot use them for nonlinear equations to, to represent solutions uh, with a certain right-hand side or so by an integral representation. And that's, pro that's even in Rn, if you have a nonlinear equation. Uh, here, uh, there are ways of, uh, we don't even have an equation in. I mean, the, the harmonic functions here, even if, we talk about harmonic functions. Uh, they are based on um, this minimization of the integral. And it is not clear or not even known and probably not even true in general that the sum of two harmonic functions is harmonic in this generality. And uh, they still minimize the energy that I wrote there, but the sum will not necessarily, at least it's not known. Um, um, and so uh, it's, um, yeah, so the, the, the representation you are asking for is, is not really existing here and is not studied. Maybe did not answer your question, at least not satisfactorily, I guess. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so um, you've talked about a lot of um, harmonic functions or p harmonic functions. So, like, um, in my point of view, is like um, differential operator of u equals zero. Mm -hmm. Can we have something more or more intricate right hand sides if they have a variational structure? Uh, well, yeah, but. You could be minimizing an integral where you have the energy and then say minus f times function u or something like that. Uh, that is uh, in a way very little studied in this setting, um, but there should be a lot of things that are doable there as well. It's just that there's so many questions already for just minimizing the energy integral or p energy integral. So it has not been done, but that's definitely something one could study. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I should add to your question a little bit. There's a notion of derivatives that can actually be defined on these metric spaces, so-called Cheeger gradient, which is a vector value. Then one actually gets an equation and for P equal to two, one would have uh, Cheeger harmonic functions, and those would be very much imitating the properties of harmonic functions, say from from Rn. So there, one knows the linearity, and then the integral representations would would also, at least to some extent, be be valid. Any further questions? 
I have a quick question. So you mentioned this uh, homogeneous Neumann data. So can yeah. you do non-homogeneous Neumann problem? Well, with... not with this trick uh, that um, you just forget about it because that's, it's a homogeneous one that's built into, into that. There is at least one paper by Nageshan Mungalingam and I guess, well, at least three more people, two or three more people, the, one or two papers that they have uh, studied a non they have a notion of defining the non-homogeneous Neumann data. And again, since you don't really have a um, derivative, the, what, what's the normal derivative? <laughs> um, it's not quite clear how to define that and what that would mean, because we want to define something that would in a natural way generalize the situation from Rn. Otherwise, it's maybe not so useful. But they have, and there is a paper. I can, I can give it. I can show you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Do we have any questions from online audience? Okay. So let's thank Jana again. Thank you very much.